So if you remember from Wednesday, we discussed how to introduce what would be called the loop pairing, which is the way that we get rid of large quantities of water. I'm going to finish up with the area area system discussing how we conserve water. So in between consumption of food and beverage, the organism or the human is going to slowly dehydrate. And if this gets to a long enough extent, we're going to have to work on conserving water, keeping water in the bloodstream rather than extreme it in the urine. So the conserved water, or to conserve water, the type of urine that's produced is called concentrated. And it's concentrated because we have less water, which results in a higher amount of sodium chloride in other metabolites. Okay, so this is the urine that's real dark yellow in color because of low amounts of water, higher amounts of those dissolved solids. So to conserve water and produce this concentrated urine, glomerular filtration occurs as normal. So we're still producing that same normal filtrate. Then in the descending loop, the descending limb of the nephron loop, we're going to have a large amount of water that's least from that filtrate back into the kidney, where then can be picked up by those capillaries of the peritubular capillaries system and beta -ray. So that seems like a step in the right direction. We're recovering the water that's been deposited into the filtrate. On the ascending loop side, we actually make the kidney more salty. So NaCl, the sodium chloride, sodium and chloride ion, are going to flow into the kidney, into the kidney. During this time, we actually have no water exchange. And so now this appears to be a step in the wrong direction because now we're producing more dilute urine. But what's now happened is that kidney is really, really salty. And given the opportunity to make that salty kidney less salty, we're going to rush a bunch of water into that kidney. So remember, we're basically going through a process of dehydration. This reduces our, um, our blood volume because of a lower water content. Less water is going to be present. We've removed a lot of it into the filtrate. It's remaining inside of the tubular system. So blood volume begins to drop. And that lower blood volume is going to be detected. So low blood volume created because of the lower water, the lower amount of water that's in the bloodstream. That's going to be detected just like we saw with producing dilute urine. That change in blood volume is detected in particular. Hypothalamus and pituitary gland are going to respond. And the results here are to increase the release of that hormone, antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Now, ADH releases from the posterior pituitary gland, circulates absolutely everywhere, but affects, in particular, the collecting duct, where all of the nephron that are filtering the blood are now depositing what is really a very dilute urine. We want to concentrate. So we have dilute urine that's entering into the collecting duct, 
we need to concentrate it. So we want to have a bunch of water get removed from that collecting dump. Well, what's happening over here in the kidney? The ascending loop, or the ascending lid of the loop of Henle has just deposited a bunch of sodium and chloride into the kidney tissue itself. It's really, really salty. So if we can make the collecting duct permeable, water is going to rush out of that collecting duct to make that kidney tissue less salty. And we're going to recover a large amount of water. So with the antidiuretic hormone being released, it acts upon the cells of the collecting duct to result in an increase in permeability of that collecting duct. So we've increased water permeability, meaning that water is able to cross those cells much easier. Antidiuretic hormone stimulates the production and insertion in the membrane of the collecting ducts of protein called aquaporins. These are pores that fit into the membrane, creating a passageway for water to be able to cross. And they're going to cross down their concentration rate. We have higher concentration in the collecting duct, lower concentration in the kidney tissue because it's salty, and so water begins to rush out of the collecting duct into the kidney. That makes the filtrate inside of the collecting duct far more concentrated as we lose that water. So water is going to exit the now permeable collecting duct. So it exits the tubule to lead into the tissue and the bloodstream. And the big take home message here for what we've just done with that urine that's going to be deposited into the bladder, that urine is going to have a much lower water content because we've just lost all of it through the collecting duct cells, a much higher sodium chloride content because we're just getting rid of the water, not the sodium chloride. And that water is concentrated. It's concentrated in the collecting duct and then it's passed onto the urinary system for expression. Alright, so that's everything I'm going to give you on the urinary system. We're going to begin to tackle the endocrine system. Everybody have everything they need here. So you can start a new section of notes in your or outlining your notes rather. So when we consider the endocrine system as a physiological system. It's actually a little bit different than several of the other systems we've already talked about. When we were talking about the circulatory system, it was the heart and all of the connected vessels. And so the physiological system really was sort of like one connected physiological unit. The endocrine system is a little bit different in that it's a collection of cells, tissues, <laughs> And organs. So it's a collection of cells, tissues, and organs. And they're not necessarily physically attached. They're still going to be affixed to each other, just not like a, uh, a normal, or a, I guess I should say normal, but another physiological system. The lungs and all the lung stuff, the organs and tissue, are all connected together. The circulatory system is all connected together. The lymphatic system is all connected together. The tegmentary system of the skin is all connected together. Here, what we're going to find is we have this collection of cells, tissues, and organs, and they're distributed around the entire organism and aren't physically attached together. They're connected through the bloodstream. 
So they interact through the bloodstream. So each of these cells, tissues, and organs that are properly part of the endocrine system, they produce chemicals. And those chemicals are referred to as messengers. And just like a messenger here in society is an individual that carries or who carries information from one location to another, you might send a messenger out to and say, they're having chicken in the calf today. And you've just been relayed a message from a messenger. These chemicals that are produced, they also are going to hold information and relay, relay that information between two entities. Okay, so we relay information between two entities. The messenger, the proper name for the messengers, these chemicals that are produced to carry information about the status of an organism, are hormones. Now, even though there's no physical connection between all of these different cells and tissues and organs, they still are connected together so they can relay that information. And the connecting factor is the blood. The connecting factor is the blood. So when a hormone is produced by a cell or by some tissue, that hormone is released from that cell, enters the bloodstream, travels a distance to a second location, to a target, where it is going to have a, an effect as it relays that information onto that new tissue. The cells and organs and tissues are frequently organized into what are called endocrine glands. Now, there's another term that I want to um, introduce you to real quick and actually talked about it really briefly. That term is exocrine. We also have glands that are exocrine glands. The big difference between an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland is the exocrine gland delivers its substance through some sort of tubular system that we call a duct. The endocrine gland does not have a duct. It's a ductless system. It's a group of cells surrounded by capillaries, and through exocytosis, the chemicals are released into the extracellular fluid to be picked up by the bloodstream to serve. Over here with the exocrine gland, I may have some sort of uh, some sort of structure, maybe it's the digestive system, and I have a tube that comes down or a duct that releases the substance from that organ or that group of tissue so that substance is put into the duct and it travels down and releases into the wound. Whereas with the endocrine gland, we have our cells and we have the capillary, and through exocytosis we release the chemical into the bloodstream. So our endocrine glands they produce hormones use that ductless system so no tube to circulation it's just as the molecule being released and it gets absorbed or picked up by the capillaries so no tube to more circulation So to release a hormone from an endocrine gland, first that hormone is going to be produced by the cells of the endocrine gland. So they're produced in the intracellular fluid, inside of the cell. And then from there, those hormones are secreted through the membrane of that cell to the extracellular fluid initially. So we go from intracellular fluid through the membrane into that tissue fluid or the extracellular fluid surrounding those cells, and then eventually we're passed into the bloodstream. Now, 
we really can go through two different mechanisms to get to the bloodstream. If it's a smaller molecule, we can go directly through the clefts in the capillary, directly into the blood. So that hormone can be passed into the blood directly. There are some hormones that are bigger molecules, and they actually cannot effectively cross the, the capillary wall. So these are picked up by the larger lymphatics and passed into the lymph, but you all already know that eventually that lymph makes its way back into the bloodstream. So ultimately, these hormones are going to be passed back into the blood where they begin to circulate. Some of them just have to go through the lymphatic system first because it's easier to get material into the lymphatic system because the spaces between the cells that make up the lymphatic wall are bigger. All right, so just to make sure that everybody's up on the exocrine gland that I've already shared in picture. Again, those exocrine glands, do not confuse those as part of the endocrine system. By the way, can anyone think of a possible exocrine organ, or exocrine um, gland that we might have? So remember, it's a substance that's released into a duct, and then that duct is released into the organ of the end of the surface of the skin. Sweat glands. So a sweat gland is an example. Sweat is produced and it's released into the duct and eventually makes its way on the surface of the skin to help off with skin cool. So that's an example of an exocrine gland because it's ducted. I don't think that's, that may not even really be a word. But anyways, I'm going to use it. It has a duct, which is a tube to some sort of external site, external from the gland itself, not necessarily external to the environment, but it could be like the exocrine gland called the sweat gland that releases substance to surface of the skin, which is an external environment. There's also the pancreas, which we're going to find out is actually a dual endocrine exocrine gland or tissue. The exocrine portion, we release digestive enzymes to the common bile duct. That common bile duct travels into the small intestine. So these exocrine glands produce substances. They still produce substances. They're not hormones, but they are substances, including sweat. We've seen mucus glands before, the tears, the digestive fluid, all of that stuff is excreted through exocrine glands, which are not part of the endocrine system. All right, so a gland or an endocrine gland. As you can see from this um, picture, we have many different endocrine glands. Uh, some of these tissues that are included on here, such as the, uh, the kidney, you can also put in the heart, which is actually shown on there, the lungs, you can put in the brain, you can put in the uh, small intestine. These are all going to produce hormones themselves, but they are not true exo uh, endocrine glands. All right. So the true endocrine glands are going to be things like the testes and the ovaries, the adrenal glands, pancreas, the thymus, the parathyroid, and the thyroid, the pituitary, the pineal, which is what's shown up here, and the hypothalamus. <laughs> Those have a primary function in producing hormones. Other tissues, including the kidney, the heart, the lungs, the small intestine, the gallbladder, they all do produce some hormones, but those hormones, the brain as well, but those hormones are being produced as secondary to the main function. The heart mainly functions in circulation. The digestive system mainly functions in digestion. The kidneys is a urinary organ, okay, but they all can still produce some hormones. So when we look at endocrine glands, we have a class of endocrine glands that are called the true glands. 
And basically, almost all of them that are shown here, except for the kidney and then the heart. So really, all of them that are labeled except for the kidney would be true glands. And a true endocrine gland is one that has its primary function that's endocrine. They primarily produce hormones that help to regulate the biochemistry and physiology of the organism. The list grows every year, but currently there are about 50 known hormones. So there are 50 chemicals that are produced in these glands and some of the other, what we would call secondary glands, which I'll get to in just a second, that have some sort of regulatory role that carry information about the status of the organism and affect target tissues and target cells to alter their physiology to respond to the uh, to those pieces of information. All of these are going to act in one of two ways, either through a negative feedback or a positive feedback mechanism. Now we're going to get into a little more detail on what uh, those terms mean, the, the feedback loops. But for now, just think about the negative feedback loop is responding to the information that's carried by a hormone to reduce the effect. So to go back to our urinary example, if we have to conserve water, the urinary system is getting rid of water. I release antidiuretic hormone in response to a low blood volume that says don't get rid of water anymore, save or conserve water. And so it's in the reverse direction. The kidney is now responding not to get rid of water, but it's saving water now. And so they're in opposite directions, so we call that negative feedback. During the birthing process, the head of the, of the baby pushes down on the cervix, which is the opening from the uterus into the vaginal canal, canal which acts as the birth tube. As that pressure from baby's head pushes on the cervix, a signal is sent back to the posterior pituitary to release a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin cir circulates to the myometria, which is what surrounds the muscle tissue that surrounds the uterus, and it squeezes, it causes a contraction. And that contraction actually causes the baby's head to push even harder on the surface. We have a signal, nervous signal sent back to the posterior pituitary, more oxytocin is released. So what you can see happening there is baby's head, that pressure is causing oxytocin to be released to affect the myometrium, causing more pressure to be created, and more pressure, and more pressure. So that's a positive feedback because it's in the same direction. Pressure causes more pressure to be used. So these hormones are going to work through those feedback loops to help regulate the physiological function that should be occurring to counter or to add to some physiological effect. Okay, so there's our true endocrine glands with their primary function to be produced to produce hormones. The secondary glands. And I've listed off a couple of them, things like the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver produces a hormone, uh, gallbladder, the small intestine, the stomach produces a hormone. So there's a bunch of other tissues that their primary function is not endocrine. So they act in some other area of homeostasis. They regulate some other physiological mechanism. But as a secondary function or a second function, there are tissues and organs that do produce some type of hormone. And those hormones can lead towards a positive or negative feedback to regulate some sort of physiological mechanism. Now, if you're really thinking about this, we've already discussed about another system 
that carries information. We learn our whole that system was. The nervous system. The nervous system produced an electrical signal through an action potential that was interpreted by the brain, and the brain used that information from that electrical signal to send out a response. Hey, this is what's going on. This is how we need to respond. Basically, I've just told you that we have hormones that are released because of something that's happening. They signal other parts of the body to say, hey, this needs to happen. So why the redundancy? Why do we have both an endocrine system and a nervous system if both of them are dedicated to relay information from one location to another to affect some sort of change to help maintain homeostasis? So I want to take a brief, brief moment here to look at these two communication systems and provide a little compare and contrast. I hope that you already sort of know the end of the conversation here and that really it's not redundant. That God doesn't make things that are imperfect that we need backup like this. So we're going to start out here with the nervous system. And what you know about the nervous system is we generate an impulse, which is an action potential. And that action potential, and really it's usually a series of action potentials that create almost like a barcode that can be interpreted by the brain. So that impulse is going to travel down or up or really travel along a nerve, sometimes going to the central nervous system, sometimes coming back out to the peripheral portions of the nervous system. Now that nerve is very specific. We call the location where the nerve makes contact with another cell an innervation. And that innervation is always to a specific cell. And in some cases, it would be called a specific group of cells, such as our motor unit and muscle. So when you send a signal from one location to another in the nervous system, that signal goes from one specific cell to another specific cell or group of cells. So it's very, very specific. And because it's a very, very specific impulse that's delivered from one location to another location, the response is very specific. So let me give you an example of your leg muscles to kind of exemplify this specific response. So your leg muscle is made up of different cells, and those cells are organized into motor units. And those motor units is one nerve, or one neuron, one cell of the nervous system, attached up to a couple different, up to a thousand different cells inside of your leg muscle. Those cells that are attached to that signal nerve are going to receive an impulse from the nervous system, receive information from the central nervous system that's going to say, hey, it's time to contract. And so what happens is we get a, from a single impulse, we get a single twitch of only the cells that are innervated by that particular neuron. Okay, so if it doesn't have a physical connection with that neuron, that cell, those other cells are not going to, they're not going to twitch, they're not going to go through that little contraction. And so what that means is you can actually look at a muscle and not have a twitch of all of the cells in that muscle. So it's very specific, which is really important, right? Because if I'm crossing or if I'm walking across campus leisurely, I don't really need all of those muscle cells. If I'm running away from a bear or a bus and I'm trying not to be killed, I probably want 
a lot more of those muscles because then I have better muscle contraction or more forceful muscle contraction that helps me get away. So I don't if I'm if I'm walking up to the calf, I don't want to expend all the energy to basically sprint up to the calf. And I don't want to not have all of the muscle force and contraction that I have uh, when I'm sprinting if I'm trying to get away from it. So I want to be able to regulate that. And the design of the nervous system allows us to do just that. Can you use the term also like narcotics and drugs? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, we want to have the ability to regulate the number of muscle cells that we're going to twitch for a specific task. You don't, I mean, you go to dunk a basketball, you want to actually get up to the hoop. If you're running down the floor, you don't want to have to jump up and down to run really fast because that would be really wasteful, right? So we want to be able to regulate how we twitch our muscle. When we look at the endocrine system, by contrast, which here would be uh, an example of what the endocrine system could look like. We have a cell that secretes the hormone. Here's our connecting factor in the bloodstream. And notice that the hormone can target multiple different cells. And in fact, hormones will target globally. So I'm going to call it a global information system. When you release a hormone, it doesn't just act on a single cell or a single group of cells. It acts everywhere. So those hormones are going to circulate everywhere. It's a little bit different, right, because the nerves went from one specific location to another specific location. Now we're just distributing the hormones everywhere. In fact, really the only tissue that is somewhat protected from different hormones is the brain. We have this thing called the blood-brain barrier. And this is a, a, a barrier or it's a physiological mechanism that reduces the overall exposure of the brain to a lot of different types of chemicals, but not all chemicals. This results in a general communication modality. So we have a global interaction. Hormones are not going to specific cells, like a nerve signal is. They're going everywhere. Now that general communication doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to be able to have a specific response. We still actually can have a specific response. And the, the specific response is going to come from a second element in the endocrine system. That second element is going to be what's called a receptor. So we release the hormone and it goes everywhere. Testosterone, when it's released, it's going to affect the uh, rate of sperm production in the male. It's also going to uh, affect skeletal muscle all at the same time. We're not sending a specific signal to skeletal muscle to one of your muscle and a specific signal to, to the uh, Sertoli cells of the reproductive system if we want to regulate sperm production. It goes everywhere.
but we still can have specific response specific responses in some of our tissues because those hormones even though they're, they're going absolutely everywhere they're circulating to every corner of the body with exception to uh, to a certain degree in the brain those hormones interact still with specific cells <clears throat> if we use the nervous system to regulate muscle size and muscle development and sperm production as well, we need to have an individual individual nerve fiber that goes to a specific group of muscle cells. So we have a lot more nerves, and we have to have individual nerves that go to specific tissues or really specific cells or groups of cells in the reproductive system to regulate sperm production. So this helps us to be able to communicate a little bit different. Notice also the time frame here, the timeline of events. If I want to run away from a dangerous stimuli, that's something that happens instantaneously. If I want to regulate, uh, let's say, sperm production, I want to regulate that over days and weeks. I don't want to have an instant boom, okay, all my sperm has been produced. This is, needs to be regulated. Where if I'm trying to get away from something, I want that to happen instantaneously. So notice that nervous system typically is not used to look at really long-term mechanisms, such as sperm production or muscle, muscle growth or going through puberty, but rather the very specific regulatory mechanisms that occur instantaneously or in a very short amount of time. So we still have hormones that interact with specific cells. Those specific cells are always referred to as target cells. Okay, so over here in this example, the pancreas, and in particular the cells in the pancreas that are known as the beta cells, release a hormone called insulin. Insulin circulates everywhere, and it targets primarily three different tissues. And if you release insulin, we target all three of those tissues. It's going to be the adipose tissue where you store fat, your skeletal muscle where you use glucose, I'm sorry, the adipose tissue where you store glucose, the skeletal muscle where you use glucose and store some of it, and the liver where you store additional glucose. Okay? So we release insulin, that's our hormone, and it interacts with those three cells those three different types of cells, which are our target cells. And those target cells are targets for that hormone as defined by the presence of receptors. In this case, we have a receptor that's called the insulin receptor that specifically binds to insulin. It doesn't really bind other hormones all that well. There's some affinity for some other hormones, but for the most part, if insulin is present, we're going to buy insulin with our insulin receptor. And that is going to lead towards some downstream changes, which is what you see here. In this case, it's to bring glucose into the cell, bringing sugar into the cell. So consider this as a target cell. And what if I don't have uh, uh, a receptor over here in this neighboring cell? Even if it's in the same tissue, if there's no receptor, this cell right next door is not going to be able to respond. You need the receptor to be to be defined as a target cell. So the presence of those receptors allows hormone hormones to bind to that target tissue through that receptor. So the hormones bind to the receptors. And what happens, basically what you see here in this figure is a change in the physiology, the biology, the metabolism, the biochemistry of that particular cell. So I'm just going to label that as being binding of the receptor causes a chain of events in the cell. And those chain of events lead towards a change in physiology for that particular cell. Now these receptors, the binding that has occurred, the binding that occurs is under a high specificity. 
And this term specificity just references that individual receptor types, such as the insulin receptor, bind to specific hormones, such as only insulin, with a high with a high affinity or a high robustness. Okay. So to make sure you understand specificity, if this is the insulin receptor, how well does it bind to insulin? Really, really well. What if the hormone is adrenaline, or also called epinephrine? Won't bind near as well. Okay. So it's specific. So how would I bind epinephrine to a cell? I'd be an epinephrine receptor. So because of this specificity, we consider the receptors that bind hormones to act under what's called a lock and key mechanism. Now what that means is the hormone acts like a single type of key that fits just one type of lock. Right? You can take out your car key. You're not going to be able to open this door here with that car key because it's not the specific key for that car. The same thing happens here. The keys are the hormones, the locks are the receptors. Only one hormone, like the key, fits one receptor, like the lock. Okay, so those are some pretty big differences. What about response time? I already alluded to response time here just a little bit. So the response time for the endocrine system is much slower. How fast does it take for you to remove your hand from a hot burner? It's almost instantaneous. In fact, it's probably a lot faster than you can even count. How long does it take for you to take your blood pressure if it's a little bit high, let's say 130 over 90, to bring it back down to 110 over 70? It may actually take minutes, maybe even take a couple hours. So it's much slower. Nerves always act. Basically in milliseconds. So we get a millisecond response for most of our nerves. There's a, some, some that are a little bit slower, but even a little bit slower, we're still, we're still talking about seconds and not even tens of seconds. On the endocrine side, typically we're talking about responses that occur in 20 seconds or longer, and many of them actually occur much longer than this over weeks or even over years with examples like the, uh, the process of going through puberty. Now, this slower response of the endocrine system means that the endocrine system is not adequate for reflexes. If we use the endocrine system to regulate that what's called cross extensor reflex that we basically use when we put our hand out on a hot burner. Your hand can be on there for 20 seconds before you're like, oh, ouch. And by that time, your hand is probably going to be basically destroyed. So it's not adequate for reflexes. It's better to use the nervous system for those types of activities. However, the endocrine system is adequate for long-term regulation. And it's actually going to be better for long-term regulation, primarily because every time you use a nerve signal, it costs some energy. If you only regulated both the quick or short-term and the long-term, you would use your nervous system so much, you'd have a huge energy expenditure that you're going to have to cover. And there's probably not enough food on this planet for all of us to consume that kind of energy requirement. So it's going to be good for long-term regulation. 
And I'm going to finish up here today um, with some examples, some brief examples on long-term regulation, and then I'll let you go. How we regulate our blood pressure is primarily regulated through an endocrine system reaction. Now, the nervous system is not completely uninvolved in blood pressure regulation, but we regulate blood pressure very heavily by the endocrine system. You already know that the type of urine that we form is regulated by the presence or lack of presence of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, which is uh, an endocrine component. Life changes, things like going through puberty, the aging process, many of these are regulated by hormones as well. All right, I'm going to let you know just a little bit early today. Two minutes.